So my name is Mandy Davis. I am the director of Trauma-Informed Oregon, which is housed at the School of Social Work at Portland State University at the Regional Research Institute, funded by OHA, otherwise known as Oregon Health Authority. That was like six acronyms in one sentence. All you really want to remember about that is Trauma-Informed Oregon. And that really is the main thing because all of our PowerPoints are online. They're free. You can download them. We want you to use the information. Hopefully in the next two or three months, there'll be free online training modules that you can use and et cetera. So check out our website. A lot of you and your peers and colleagues have written for our website, so there's lots of good information on there. So do access that. Um, we are going to get started. I usually train in six-hour and four-hour blocks. So you ready? <laughs> A good presenter knows how to cut down stuff. I don't. Um, so, but it's right after lunch, right? You just had lunch. So we're going to talk about trauma right after lunch, and that's going to be okay in a room with um, no natural light, and we're going to make this work. So the first thing I'm going to actually ask you to do is an activity. I'm going to invite you to do it. You don't have to do it. You can stand up or you can sit down. But what we're going to do is we always in the trauma-informed world want to start meetings and gatherings with what we call a right brain activity. I did not say a therapy session. I said a right brain activity, right? So what I'm going to ask you to do is to take your right hand, and what I'd like you to do is to make a figure eight with your right hand. I'm counting. You're going to do about eight of them. Now I want you to take your other hand, your left hand, and do the same thing. Don't watch me because it'll be very confusing for you. Now I want you to take both fingers and do them together. All right, excellent. So what we're doing there is we're connecting your right and left brain, because I need both online for us to have this conversation. So that's what that's all about. You can also do this kind of stuff, right? But that's dangerous for me today. OK, so we're going to jump in. Um, I'm not going to go around the room and ask you who you are. Does anybody know why somebody who speaks about trauma-informed care would not go around the room and ask you to say who you are? Because it's traumatizing for a lot of folks. So, and the reason I'm pointing that out right now is everything I'm going to try to talk to you about, I'm also going to try to practice to the best that I can. Because what I really want you to hear from today is, a is like demystify what trauma-informed care is. Okay, to demystify that. So for a lot of folks, if I said, stand up and tell us your name and what animal you would like to be today, you would start to have a coughing fit and find your way out of the room. Because it would be getting, your anxiety would start to be happening for you or your stress response system would get activated. So again, take that with you and kind of think about how you ask people to kind of come into a room or be in a room in a meeting or whatever that looks like. But I would like to know a little bit about who's in the room. So my name is Mandy. I'm a social worker in all degrees, bachelor's, master's, clinical license, PhD. So if you don't like social workers, this is hopefully going to be a corrective emotional experience. Like we're going to, we're going to work on that, right? Because I know what my profession has done to lots of people in the world. Okay, so first of all, so how many people in the room would admit to being a lawyer? Excellent. Judges in the room? Okay. Uh, mental health providers, behavioral health providers? All right. Uh, mental health or non mental health nurses or so nurse, nursing folks? A couple. Okay. Physicians in the room? Peer support in the room? Wah, wah. <laughs> Uh, who else, anybody else in the room want to be businesses? Excellent, businesses in the room. What's that? Housing, thank you. Housing was the first industry to get trauma-informed care. Did you hear that? Trauma-informed care started in the housing kind of world, and then the rest of us went, oh, that's a good idea, right? Yes. Crime law reform advocate. You need an acronym for that, I think. There's got to be one somewhere. Okay. So we're going to get started. The reason I ask who's in the room in profession is that each of you need to, are going to need to hear this information and decide what to do with it. Trauma-informed care doesn't look different in every industry or every profession. But the same information I give, I give to everybody. So whether it's an early childhood specialist, whether it's a... Hello, is that working? Okay. Whether it's law enforcement, judges, um, I'm getting ready to go talk to waste management. Yeah. Don't know what they're going to do with trauma-informed care, but trauma-informed waste management, right? We're talking to park, uh, park folks, natural resource managers, who are intersecting with folks who are houseless, 
Right. So the uh, same information goes to everybody, but how you use it is going to be up to you. You're the experts in your profession. So really, as we go through today, be thinking, what does that have to do with me, and what can I do with that information based on the role that I play in kind of the work that we do? Now, we're only going to be talking for, you know, an hour and ish, some change, and then I will try to stop for some questions, so do think about those things. But a couple of things are just being in the room. It's after lunch. We're talking about trauma. I, we don't talk about trauma stories, so you need to know that. We're talking about a way to do the work differently. But we always want to start with understanding how to be in the room. Now, in the back, there's some paper. It's also on our website, but we call it the pink piece of paper. We developed this pink sheet to use in meetings, and it was developed with folks with lived experience in conjunction with our staff to say, how do you have a trauma-informed meeting, right? And it was things like, you know, have space for people to move about, because sitting in a hard chair staring at somebody for hours on end usually isn't very helpful. You'll take in about 30% of the information, right? So again, I want you to start thinking about this, of how do you really incorporate this information. There are three things you can do to uh, reduce, to kind of deactivate your stress response system. And what I mean by activation is that your stress response system gets activated. And that means your heart starts racing, you might feel in your belly, your face gets flushed, you might sweat, right? Have a hard time remembering words. That's activation. So there are three things you can do to reduce that activation that are still free as of today. Does anybody know what those, some of those things might be? Breathing. Yeah. Yeah. Take a breath, right? Breathe. Now, this sounds like, okay, let's breathe. But have you ever been in a staff meeting or in court with somebody and they're doing that like, <laughs> or they're like this, <gasps> they're just all pent up? Do you, have, you ever, have you ever been around that person or been that person? Right? Yeah. So they don't tend to be very engaging or able to engage with what's going on. Now, in that moment, the best thing for you to do is not to go, dude, breathe. That's like being told to calm down. Right? What is the best thing for you to do? See, anybody know? It's for you to breathe. We call that mirror neuron or co-regulation. So the first thing I'm going to do is take my breath. And I'm going to hope that then is going to, more likely you are to breathe. Now, if you don't breathe, then we'll deal with some other stuff. You call in nurses and doctors and that kind of stuff, right? But we actually learned those techniques from early childhood. Has anybody been around little people? You know when little people fall down and they hurt themselves and they look at you? And if you're like, oh, my God, Ugh. they're like, oh, right? And if you're like, ah, oh, you're fine, they're like, okay, right? That's, I mean, there's, there's stuff happening there on a neurobiological epigenetic level that is having that happen. So you want to incorporate that in your work too, right? So when I go to court with people, I stand beside them a lot of times, and I stand, I look probably odd to others, but I stand beside them and breathe. <sighs> right? Because it's going to remind them to do the same. So you're going to breathe. The second thing you can do to deactivate your stress response system is to drink water. I know the rates of alcoholism in our professions, right? So to drink water, black tea, things that detoxify your system, not Red Bull coffee or alcohol, right? So water, Breathe. The third thing is to move around. Move around. Stand up, right? So if you need to do that. So the reason I say all this is, one, you want to think about when you have meetings or in your court, what is the capacity of people to do that, right? Do you have water available for people? Those type of things. Can people move about in your systems? But you also want to just do that today. So if you need to stand up today and move about, you know, feel free to do that. On the back, the other thing that we love for people to have is fidget toys. And on the back, there's some pipe cleaners because I didn't have enough to put on everybody's. I want to be fair and just, right? Now, the state of Oregon, some abuse folks have asked me not to call them pipe cleaners. So don't clean your pipes with them. They are chenilles or craft straws, supposedly, but I can't get that out of my mouth and not feel weird. Um, so, but you, know, we, you carry those around with you. You should have fidget toys in your pockets at all times, right? For yourself, for your coworker, for if you're in court with somebody. And depending on the population you work with will depend on the fidget toy you choose. If you work with folks around 14 and 15 or under, don't use rubber bands. They shoot them at you, in case you don't know. But, so, be thinking about all of that, how to care for yourself today here, as well as how to take that information into your work. What we're striving for in trauma-informed care is we are striving for whole brain. To the extent that you can bring your whole brain to the table, we want your whole brain to the table. I can't always do that 
based on lots of different things. But I don't want my room or my policy or my program or my language or my intake question to be the reason why your, your brain is not able to be whole in the moment. Okay? So we're striving for whole brain. Now, we're going to jump right in. I'm going to define trauma-informed care. We're going to talk about why it's important. We're going to go through the scientific foundation of it, like what's behind all this. And then we'll talk about some application. And in that, we'll try to have you talk to each other just so your neurobiology stays awake. Are you ready? How many people have heard about trauma-informed care? How many people will stand up and define it for me? <laughs> it always happens. OK. So, cause, and, I, and I joke about that because that's not a fair question in a room to have you do that. But I really do want you to get to the place where you can say what it is. And the words and language you use are different in different industries. So in schools, we talk about building resilient environments. It's the same thing as trauma-informed care, right? So really start to think about what language will work best in your, you know, kind of in your environment. Um, behavioral health courts, I was talking to a county recently in drug court, kind of trauma-informed care drug courts, what does that mean? right? Trauma-informed early childhood, trauma-informed detention. There's been a lot of work done in that. So again, we'll, have, we'll look at some different examples as we go through. What is trauma-informed care? This is a definition by SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Service Administration. We like it, so we're using it. It says that a program organization or system is trauma-informed if, and it's going to have lots of things like the three and four R's or the three E's because it works for your brain. Do you remember what to do if your clothes catch on fire? Does anybody know? Stop, drop, and roll. Where did you learn that? Kindergarten, and you still remember. Do you remember what you did last Wednesday at 2 o'clock? Probably not, right? So again, you think about these things because there's a reason why we have things the way they are, right? So a program organization is trauma-informed if you realize the widespread impact of trauma. Now, the number one thing I want to tell you is the first few words here was a program, organization, or system. Hear that. It did not say an individual, family, or group. The biggest misconception in trauma-informed care across the country is that it is about therapy for trauma. Trauma-informed care is an organizational system change intervention. It's about what we, how we do our work to stop re-traumatizing people. Did you hear that? Because that is probably the biggest important thing you walk away with. I won't teach people about trauma interventions. There are other people that do that. I'm interested in how you do the work, okay? And so we'll look at examples of what that looks like. So the number one thing you got, first thing you got to do is realize the widespread impact of trauma. Do you know what trauma looks like in the populations that you serve or in the communities for which you work? It looks different in Eastern Oregon and in Southern Oregon and in Central Oregon, right? It looks different in five-year-olds and 65-year-olds. So get real about your data because, you know, you got to, if people don't believe trauma happens, they're not going to buy into trauma-informed care, right? So in one juvenile detention uh, center I worked with, we just started putting posters on the wall that had localized, real data about folks that people could connect to. So you couldn't ignore that it was happening, right? It's like, this is real and it happens. So realize that. The second thing is we want you to recognize the signs and symptoms of adversity and trauma in those that you serve. But who else is noticed up here besides the families? Yeah, your coworkers, right? You need to know what each other looks like when you're getting activated. Do you ever get activated in your work? Right? And it, like we work with co-teachers, like people who teach together. We want them to have those conversations. Because you don't all look the same when you get activated. How many of you, when you get activated, are the ones that just kind of shut down? You stare at a wall. Any of those in the room? How many of you start talking really fast and you da 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 da, -da you're those folks, right? We all look different. If you don't, and you're actually the worst person to know what you look like. So if you want to know what you look like when you're activated, go home and talk to the people in your life because they'll be happy to share. Right? They'll be happy to share. And the reason we want people, all people, and again, let me make this really important point. In an organization or a program, it's everybody needs to know this. My most important folks in the school system are the bus drivers and the folks who work in the cafeteria and the folks in the front office. That's who I'm talking to. In a courtroom, the person who is um, like the court reporter who never went to school to hear the stuff that the court reporters hear and read. They were my biggest teachers about three years ago. I was working with some court reporters. They're like, I never saw it. I, I go home and have nightmares about what I read. So we changed that. The judge went, you know what? I can tell you not to read page three and five because it's unnecessary. It's like, let's do that. Let's redact information because this isn't, this isn't, no one got training in court reporter school about how to manage hard content. 
right? And yet that's going to have an impact on that court reporter's ability to engage on the day in the job and in the family, okay? So realize signs, recognize signs and symptoms. We want you to actually respond. I joke a lot about this. I'm a social worker and sometimes an academic, which means we love to realize and we love to recognize things. We kind of forget to respond. So we want to get beyond just knowing it happens. We want you to do something. I expect everyone to leave today and be able to do something different to be a little bit more trauma-informed. So we really, really want you to respond. But we want you to respond by integrating this stuff into your policies and procedures. What are your vacation policies for staff? One agency we work with changed their policies that every staff member during their year had to kind of say when they would take one vacation at least. That was at least five days in a row. Now, what does that have to do with trauma-informed care? You should be saying that with everything that comes out of my mouth. What does that have to do with trauma-informed care? When you take a day off here and there, what do you tend to do? Think about work. What else? Run errands. Some people binge watch Netflix, right? Some people just sit and drool. Yeah, you know, we, what we don't tend to do with a day here and there is do what's called restorative practice. Is your work challenging? Yeah, I mean, you are, you know, using cognitive capacity every day. You've got to restore that. Taking a day off to worry about work while you're running errands is not, and watching usually shows that remind you of work doesn't restore your brain. Van der Kolk, who's kind of the trauma guru guy, talks about one of the key ingredients of healing from trauma for children, and I would argue for adults too, we've just lost the art, is imagination. The key ingredient for healing is imagination for children because that helps you see a different route, a new way, gives you innovation and hope. But when you're stressed out, you don't tend to have that. I would argue today that with the complexity of issues we are dealing with, we need you to have your imagination to be innovative. And yet if your staff aren't able to do that because they're stressed out, we get reaction, you know, reaction kind of work happening, and we just keep doing the same thing over and over again. So think about things like trauma-informed care is going to ask about vacation policies. It's going to ask about procedures for when I need to take a break. How can that happen? What if I'm flipping out in the middle of a court, right? Where do I go for that? So policies and procedures, then practice. And then we'd love for you to resist re-traumatization. Sounds like a pretty easy thing to do. But here's the deal. There's a lot of things we do in our work that's re-traumatizing. Removing a child from an unsafe home, no matter what the reasoning, is, is traumatizing for that child and that family, no matter what. But if it needs to happen, we can do that. But how we do that makes a difference. So we're going to resist re-traumatization. And when we know things are going to be re-traumatizing, we're going to try to mitigate that to the best that we can. Okay? So that's what trauma-informed care is. This is the framework. I'm not going to go through a lot of this, but I just want to bring to your attention that these are the principles we ask your organizations to look at. And courts are doing a lot of this work. So we ask things like, how does your program, organization, or community promote physical and emotional safety? How do you promote transparency and trustworthiness? How do you promote, do you have peer support? It's a requirement of trauma-informed care. Right? Do you, how do you kind of promote collaboration, empowerment, voice, choice, and how do you incorporate the historical kind of gender and cultural needs of those you serve? So that's how you would assess your organization, and we'll talk about ways to do that. You'll notice there's something here called financing as one of the domains. So all of these domains that we actually measure your organization on, only two or three are related to directly to direct practice. So trauma-informed financing, got any ideas? Because I, I don't. Feds. I actually do. I, I think trauma-informed financing, two big things. I think programs need to have flexible funding so that not everyone has to have an hour of therapy, but maybe that person needs to go to martial arts and we should be able to pay for that. So I think that's one way to have trauma-informed care. I think the other thing is we need to have workforce wellness as part of a budget and not as like an extra, we had a couple hundred bucks left over and we bought some ice cream for staff. I want to see a line item budget for workforce wellness and that's a finance issue that would tell me you're trauma-informed as we strive for that. Now, I'm going to move through some of this stuff pretty quickly because we don't have time for the whole thing today, but I want to set context. It's important whenever you talk about trauma that you define the word trauma and how you mean it. If I go to the hospital and say I have a trauma, what most likely will they think about? Yeah, head trauma. Trauma, physical body trauma. And so it's important to define this. When we talk about trauma and trauma-informed care land, kind of exists in my head, but it can be a single incident trauma, 
But trauma-informed care is really built on what we call complex trauma. So trauma as a child propels you into our systems. What are our systems? Child welfare, housing, safety net services, psychiatric services, those services that are re-traumatizing or traumatizing. We age you out of those, and it kind of continues from there. Okay, so complex trauma. It's very important that we add, we're going to ask you to widen your lens of how you define trauma. And we don't have time today, but it, normally I would ask you, what is your definition of trauma? Right? What is, that, what is that for you? And it's often like 10 questions on your intake form. But what we know now is that trauma is bigger than those 10 traditional things that we thought about. It also includes experiences of institutional abuse, of racism, of systemic oppression. That experiencing those things have similar impacts on your brain and your body and your wellness and more importantly, your ability to engage with a system. So we'd like you to start to think about that broader. There are some even advocating for assessing for that. We're not quite there yet of how to do that, but a really important message. Do you, have you heard of the adverse childhood experiences? So there's 10, we'll talk about that, and there's 10 of those. Do you know that you can say no to all 10 and still have experienced things like systemic, systemic abuse, systemic trauma, institutional abuse, and that wouldn't get counted, right? Which is why we need to widen the lens of our understanding of that. Now, a big important message, trauma-specific versus trauma-informed. Again, the big misconception. Trauma-specific services or interventions that we do with individuals and families and groups, either to promote trauma, post-trauma growth or to help reduce symptomology someone's experiencing. If they are from the white dominant culture, they'll come with acronyms and certifications. Things like EMDR, TFCBT, TREM, like, eh, we can go on forever. PCIT, collaborative problem. So lots of interventions. There are also plenty of traditional health interventions that also work to, to promote post-trauma growth and reduce symptomologies that don't have certification or acronyms. Okay. Now, some of you in the room may do trauma-specific services. What we're striving for is trauma-informed care, which was in an organization kind of embodies the knowledge of near science, and we'll talk about what that means, and the impact of trauma, and by knowing that, it does things a little differently. We believe that every system needs to be trauma-informed. So think about this for a minute. I believe that the Department of Motor Vehicles should be trauma-informed. Yeah, I mean, you know, like, so think, I mean, that's, we believe libraries, were, in fact, libraries do a lot of work around trauma-informed care. Though DMV is not going to do a trauma-specific service. Maybe that would be a good idea, but, but that's not an expectation of that system. So you don't have to do trauma-specific, but we believe everyone should do trauma-informed. So housing is who got this and said, we need to do trauma-informed care because people are blowing out of housing, people are unsafe, and, and this idea that we refer them to mental health is failing because there's no mental health to refer people to, and it's not effective anyway for the folks that were, you know, so housing went, you know, we can do some stuff. We can change the lighting. We can talk about safety and noise. We can do eviction differently. We can lease sign differently. So they changed all their policies, but they're going to hire out for a trauma-specific service or bring somebody in. Does that make sense? Because you have to start to think about whether you do trauma-informed care or trauma-specific. What happens for a lot of uh, folks is they might do trauma-specific service in non-trauma-informed organizations. So when I used to do domestic violence groups in maximum security, that was a trauma-specific service in a non-trauma-informed organization. That's a pretty big hardship on staff to try to hold that, like, you have your rights and power, and, uh, and then go back to general population where you don't, right? So it's a kind of a burden on both folks to think about that. All right. Now, I'm going to sit here for longer than other things about why this stuff is so important. So the reason that trauma-informed care is so important, one thing is that it's absolutely, we believe, essential and necessary for those who have experienced adversity for you to be trauma-informed. Now, this is an important thing for you to hear. We believe trauma-informed care is an engagement tool. Does anyone here have a hard time with people showing up and staying in, any, in whatever service you provide? Because if you do, that's where trauma-informed care should show some help. You've got to have something to offer when they get there, <laughs> right? It's not going to do that for you because that's going to be different, librarian, police, et cetera. But it should it welcome people into your services in a different way. So engagement tool. So it's necessary. Now, we also think what I tell you you're going to do to be trauma-informed that all people want. Like, you're going to be like, that's nice, too, regardless of your history. And that's important. 
because it's a kind of a resource issue. But these last three things are what I want to talk about. First of all, trauma differentially affects folks. We can all experience a tragic event right here, right now, and we're all going to process that and experience that differently. What are some things that make that different? I'm just waking you up a little bit. Okay, your own experience, what you came into that tragedy with, your past experience with trauma, what, where you're sitting in the room, yeah, so your literal proximity, physical proximity to the event. What's that? Culture, yeah. Which brings both like your past experience as well as what healing opportunities you may have, kind of what you have in the sense of social support and et cetera. What else? Genetics, yeah, genetics and then epigenetics as well. Your coping skills, right, so what do you have to work with kind of post that event? Age, class, gender, race, right? And all those things are going to make a difference. And some of them make a difference of how you kind of take in that event. A lot of them make a difference of what you have access to after that event. Natural disasters happen to all folks, right? But not all folks within a community get the same amount of service after a natural disaster because of who that community is. Right? So that then lies a different level of trauma on top of that. Now, what we're interested in trauma-informed care, and this is where I really want you to kind of think about where you work, are these last two things. Trauma, we know, affects how people come into services. So we're going to do the Dan Siegel hand brain activity. If you've already done it, entertain yourself. So what I'd like you to do is put your hand up like this. This will be fun with a mic in my hand, so if I throw the mic, we'll figure this out. So I'd like you to put your thumb inside your hand and then wrap your fingers over your thumb. This is your brain. Now rest your hand for a second. How many people heard me when I said that this is your brain on drugs? Raise your hand because not everybody heard that in their brain. Look around because it's generational, right? So when I said this is your brain, some people in the room heard this is your brain on drugs. If you heard that, it's because you were around when there was a commercial or you just watched the documentary 13th because it shows up in that too, where there was a frying pan on a stove. It was a, it was a cast iron frying pan. They cracked two eggs. <laughs> said, this is your brain on drugs. And it was supposed to keep you from doing drugs. For a lot of people, it made us want to go eat eggs. You're like, eh, kind of want some eggs right now, right? Now, the reason I stop that and bring that up is because that's how your brain functions. If you had never seen that commercial, you didn't hear that when I said that. If I hadn't stopped and said anything, some of you would have been like, it would have come all the way up to consciousness. You would have been like, oh, that's that commercial. Ah, yeah, that's funny. And you would have moved on. Some of you wouldn't have gotten all the way to consciousness, but you would have left tonight and been like, I kind of want some eggs. Don't know why, right? And that's very true. So the reason I bring it up is because your brain is like a card catalog file. Those of you who don't know what a card catalog file, wait, let that generation go, and then we're going to go to the next generation. So the next generation is like the file search engine, the search engine on your file manager system and your computer. So if you go into the search engine and you put in trauma on my computer, all this stuff is going to pop up that's related to trauma. Your brain functions the same way. Now, why is this important and so important to trauma-informed care? Remember, it's an engagement tool that you have to start to think about what do you and your system and your physical space, what variables does it pop up for people? I'm a short, white, southern social worker. I work a lot with folks in child welfare. Hi, my name is Mandy. I'm a social worker. What variables are going to pop up for that person, and how are they going to respond to me as a result of those variables? Which is why I often finish with, and I'm sorry for what my profession may have done to you. Because I know something about that. So, I mean, if we had all the time in the world, I'd ask you to pair up and say, what variables, when you first meet somebody, pop up for them? And I'm not saying pop up like they go, oh, hello, short, white, southern social worker. Let me think what I know about people like you. That's not, it's not conscious like that. It's going to be an immediate. You respond to things based on your history and experience with that environment or person. When you walk into the DMV, you walk into the DMV with the past experience you had at the DMV. If it was great, then great. If it wasn't, you expect that. I once worked with a woman who came to me and said, that judge is just horrible. And she was telling everybody that judge was horrible. I knew the judge. The judge wasn't horrible. So I was fascinated. I was like, why do you think that judge is horrible? And she said, well, I went one time, and she yelled at me. Well, the truth was, yes. She went one time. The judge had a bad day. The case was tough, and she yelled at the caseworker. The caseworker never went back. Didn't have to go back. So never had a corrective experience of that. So in that caseworker's mind, it made total sense that she thought that judge was bad. But she's now extrapolated that to all judges are bad. 
or all people are going to be treated the same way by that judge. Is that making any sense? Right? And that's important when you start to think about the assumptions we start to make based on that process that isn't necessarily always conscious. Okay? So be thinking about when people walk into your building, what, what history do people have of your building? of your parking lot, of your badge, of your coat, of your car and your emblem on your car? What are all those things that people are going to start to get reactive to? And I always say to new students, because it's not about you, it's about what you're representing. I mean, it may be about you. <laughs> That's a different conversation, right? But it's a lot about what we represent for folks. So walking into court, what does that mean? Right? Going through a metal detector, what does that mean? And it means something different for different folks, okay? So let's go back to your brain. So put your brain back up here. So what Dan Siegel teaches us is that when your brain has a real threat or a what type of threat? Perceived. And that's important because a lot of times this perceived threat that we're seeing, so a real or perceived threat, uh, threat you flip your lid. Bing. They're starting to do auditory testing in the brain, and I hope it sounds like that. Bing. Right? So you flip your lid. When you flip your lid, you're losing access to your prefrontal cortex. This is your rational thinking, it's your verbal language, it's your ability to regulate and organize, it's your time order, it's all that stuff that we usually want to engage with, right? And it leaves you into your threat sensor part of your brain. Now here's a big message about trauma-informed care. We believe that a lot of people are coming to you with their lids already flipped. And you should think about this. This isn't true for all industries, but a lot of our industries, people come to us with their lids already flipped. Why might that be the case? because of their life at home, because of your parking lot, because your first person of entry said something like, you need to fill out this form. Can you pee in a cup? Bing! Right? So for a variety of reasons, before I ever see the person, their lid's already flipped. Trauma-informed care may or may not help you regulate that person in the moment. Because if you have five minutes, that may not happen. Right? So the idea of trauma-informed care is it's not always going to help that person get regulated. What it's meant to do, more importantly, is to keep you from flipping your lid. So here's what happens. Amygdala to amygdala conversation. If you ever had one of those, they don't work so well. If you have people like four-year-old, two-year-olds, under the age of seven, you have a lot of amygdala to amygdala conversation, right? So my kid, why did you hit your brother? What is he going to say if he's young? I don't know. And he doesn't because he doesn't have a frontal lobe. It's not all done yet, right? That's an amyg And, of course, I can be like, well, rationally, I do a nonviolent communication until he says, I don't know, and then I get mad and go, well, that's ridiculous, leave. Now we're in amygdala to amygdala conversation. Trauma-informed care is intended to keep you all, whoever the you all is, us, from flipping our lid. Because if you flip your lid, we can't get anywhere. And I want you to hear a really important message about trauma-informed care. The reason that I don't want you to flip your lid, or when you do, I want you to have a way to restore it, like self-care and workforce wellness, is that when we have an amygdala to amygdala conversation in systems, the person that loses out is the person with the least amount of power. Did you hear that? Because if I flip my lid because you want bus tickets, sooner or later I'm going to be like, now we're done. You're non-compliant, aggressive, and combative, and you will no longer get bus tickets from this agency. So that's why it's so important that we, that's why we focus so much on workforce wellness, because it's when staff flip their lid that we have this kind of different level of injustice that's almost even more harmful than what people came to us kind of looking for. Does that make some sense? Perfect. So, and the last bullet here says, guess what? We believe our service systems have been re-traumatizing. Not you. I'm sure you all look like nice people. But our service systems have been re-traumatizing. So we have to just own that, and we're working on restoration and reparation around that because people are coming to us expecting that no or that treatment. Okay? So that's why this stuff is so important. Sorry, I just turned white when you flashed. That was bad for you. All right. Does trauma happen a lot in the populations you serve? Okay. Because I would love not to go through too much prevalence data. Trauma happens a lot. What's really important also, and again, all this data you can access online. And really look, for, again, look for your localized data. But the connection between things like preteen trauma and then incarceration, right, the pipeline, I mean, these things are very real in the data. And yet we don't tend to remember that. 
So we see people as an adult, and we don't ask them kind of what happened to you. What else was there, right? We just see them in their adult and their adult experience versus what's happened prior to that. Trauma frequently follows solitary confinement. I want you to think about that a minute. Trauma frequently follows solitary confinement. So what I want to tell you is a really sophisticated slide. Let's see if I can pull it up. I think it just got testy. So what I, this is really sophisticated, but I want to bring this up because this is kind of when I worked with the sheriff's department, we talked a little bit about this. So you have childhood adversity that happens. Childhood adversity then leads to a more of a chance to be involved in the judicial system. And if you don't believe that, you know, let me know, I mean, because we don't have time to knock that up. But that, that's true. If you're involved in the judicial system, you're more likely to be incarcerated. Does that make sense? So now I want you to take the idea and think about those who have experienced childhood adversity tend to have more trauma and mental health symptomologies. And then I want you to envision, I don't know if you've ever been inside a detention or a jail or a prison, but think about taking someone for whom we know has trauma symptomologies and putting them inside and expecting it to go well. I mean, if you had someone who was having an anxiety attack or having a trauma symptomology, I don't think many of us would say, you should sit in the middle of the room with fluorescent lights and have people of authority stare at you and assume it's going to go well. Now, I'm not saying, I mean, again, the sheriff's department and I were really talking about this because it was like, right, and there's reasons why those things are there. But this, the symptomology then gets big. And do you know what the role of folks in detention, the role of the sheriff in that area is? To, is? Like, what's the job of the sheriff in detention? Keep people safe. Keep people safe. So if all of a sudden my symptomologies are getting activated because of the setting I'm in, I'm now looked at as not safe. And what the, what's going to happen then is I'm going to come and be plucked up and moved away for the safety of the whole. So now I'm in solitary confinement, which is going to exasperate those symptoms. And then you're going to release me from solitary confinement, and we're going to have more symptoms and therefore repeat the process. Okay? And I, I'm, not, I'm like, I don't have the easy answer for that. But at the minimum, we have to acknowledge that a lot of times what we are, we are the, my whole thing is kind of like when you have kids in the car. Do you have kids? Uh, Kids all over me all the time. Do you have kids who are like that, like, I'm not touching you? You ever like game? Like, I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you. And all of a sudden, somebody explodes. It's like, I wasn't touching you. That's like the system to me. I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you. And then you blow. We're like, oh, you need anger management classes. It's like, no, actually, I need you to stop talking to me. Right? So that's kind of how we think about this in our world. All right. I do want to just, again, I know I'm not going to read this all to you, but it's important that we acknowledge disproportionality both in the experiences of trauma as well as in our system. So we have native youth who complete suicide rates 17 times the U.S. national average. We have native youth who experience trauma 2.5 times the rate of non-native peers. Native youth experience PTSD at a rate of 22%, the same as veterans and those returning from the Iraq war. So really important that we pay attention not just to the data, but the breakdown of the data per different populations. Now, do you know that trauma and adversity affect us who do the work, those of you who are working in the system? This is data that talks about that. And I thought this was interesting. This is actually Oregon data. So 20% of, of respondents on a survey of Oregon Department of Corrections reported experiencing mental health conditions such as anxiety, depression, and traumatic stress. One in three of the Department of Correction employees has symptoms of PTSD, higher rates than firefighters and those deployed to the military. Now, this stuff is important because a lot of our work is focused on helping those who are coming to us, which is important. But if we're not caring for each other in the process, that's not going to be effective. We don't acknowledge that some of us come. So there are high rates of adverse childhood experiences in those of us who do the work. Right? Because a lot of us are in the work because of our experiences. So kind of we just take all of that into a whole. Now, I always like to point out the immigration judge stuff. So immigration judges have higher burnout levels than hospital physicians and prison wardens as of 2010. It's 2018. Does anybody know the status of immigration? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So why do, I, why do you care that a judge might experience burnout? And this is important because there's this, this, there's this thing they came up with and they watched judges. And do you know what it's called? It's called decision fatigue syndrome. Anybody heard about this? Because I think you probably have it. 
a lot of us have decision fatigue syndrome. What they found is in the course of a day, here was a disposition to a case. Course of the day. So then the beginning of the morning, it was like, yes, 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 no, 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 lunch. And then yes, yes, no, 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 no. So this is your free tip of the day. When should you go to court? Or after lunch. Free tip. Now, they didn't know why it was, a, it was a, a correlation study, not a causation study. But the more we look at this, and now this is all over the place, right? Brain breaks and watch cat videos or my staff does like fainting goat videos was a new thing, right? So the importance of every hour and a half taking 10 minutes to do nothing, to do a cat video, to watch, not to go sit and talk about work or to read an article, but to kind of check out. In schools, we do this now. Go Noodle, it's a whole program where kids stop and they move around. Why didn't we want to do that before? What scared us of that? If I have all of you stand up and do something, what am I nervous about? You won't get back down and focused. And now we found the opposite to be true. You're actually more focused if we have these breaks in the spaces, okay? Now, why is this important to you? Is that if a case disposition is being determined because of like the stress level and the time of day, that should scare you. And yet it happens. You all have done this. You've made a decision with somebody that was an important decision as a result of your stress level and the time of day. Do you know they found higher rates of cortisol stress hormone, higher rates of cortisol in children in the first 10 minutes of the day as a result of teachers who scored high on burnout levels. Let me say that again. If your teacher in front of you has high burnout, it's changing your cortisol level in the first 10 minutes of the day. That's kind of big stuff. That's kind of big stuff. So we, we actually connect to each other. Like your stress impacts me, right? Now what I really want to point out to you around all this, and especially around workforce wellness, it's around this thing called scarcity. It's all this great stuff out now. But it's about the fact that you wake up in the morning with so much cognitive capacity. You all wake up in the morning with so much cognitive capacity, so much ability to kind of participate and think and et cetera. And therefore, you have to restore it as you use it. As soon as you wake up in the morning and to trying to figure out what to wear, you are depleting your cognitive capacity. How many of you, have you ever had the moment when you had it together and you picked out your clothes and made your lunch before, like the night before? Do you ever wake up feeling better that morning? Like you're kind of like, oh, whew, wow. So, and again, we want to think about this. I want you to think about your staff. Don't have meetings at 4 o'clock. Don't work with the most challenging family or person at 4 o'clock if that's your downtime. And you have to figure out whether it's 4 or 8. We had an agency change all of their home visits to never do anything before 11 a.m. They did casework, they did paperwork until 11, then did home visits and had more chance of people showing up. So you just want to start to think about kind of how can you stay as present as possible and how do you use some of this science to do that work. Steve Jobs wore the same outfit every single day. Takes away cognitive capacity. If you are coming to work and you have to walk, we had teachers recently who said they were really stressed out because they come to work and there are a bunch of kids outside who start talking to them. Hey, miss, I need this. Hey, miss Davis, I want that. Hey, miss Davis, I want to tell you this. And the problem was by the time they got in their classroom, they already depleted 20% of their cognitive capacity. So you want to know what the big trauma-informed solution was? To go through a different door. <laughs> but here's the joke about trauma-informed care is most of the interventions are like that. But when I go places, people are so burnt out and stressed out, they can't even see that simple solution, Right? I went somewhere one time and somebody was like, this person was having a really hard time, wanted this nightgown that brought that person comfort. I was like, why don't you go buy the nightgown? It's like an $11 solution. They're like, whoa. They're like, that's amazing. I was like, it's actually not. <laughs> I didn't pay lots of student loans to tell you to buy a nightgown. You're just so stressed out, you can't figure that out, right? You're making it too complicated. All right, so again, we want to be careful because we have child welfare workers experiencing trauma. We have preschool teachers with 30% turnover rate. We have 30%, I think, kind of risk of suicide for correction officers more than other professions. Those things, you got to start looking around at each other and be like, we got to take care of each other if we're also going to be able to take care of those we serve. All right, so what does trauma from care not mean? This is often really important for a lot of your work. It does not mean permitting or allowing behavior that you think is unsafe. And that's important because people leave my work and they'll be like, well, Mandy said because they had trauma, they're allowed to throw chairs. To, to hear me clearly, not saying that, right? 
So, but we do want to, we, we support accountability. Trauma from care loves accountability, but the way you do it needs to be compassionately, right? And we want you to add the why, right? Like I understand why you're throwing the chair. Love you not to do it, but I get why you might be doing it, right? And I'm definitely going to look at what I did to maybe create that situation for happening. Is there anything I can do to reduce that? It doesn't mean just being nicer. So for those of you who aren't described as a super nice person, you're good. And in fact, you might be better at trauma-informed care. Because trauma-informed care wants direct and informative information. When the brain has flipped its lid, we do not like gray information or messy information. So if your lid is flipped and you go to someone and say, I need help, they're like, well, what, what, do, what do you think might be helpful? You're like, uh-uh. Because if I knew what was helpful, I wouldn't be asking you in the first place. Right? When your lid is flipped, you can't have that type of information. And I'll give you an example. I had someone go to court, and I said, so, what did the judge tell you to do? And they're like, nothing. I was like, that's really interesting. Because I know the judge, I know your casework, and I bet it wasn't nothing. But when you get complicated information and your lid is flipped, you're going to make the answer. Right? Do you know how that's like if I say, you know, am I going to get my kids back or not get my kids back? If I say, well, I don't know, we're going to have to see about that. I'm going to hear either what? Yes, I am or no, I'm not. And I want you to start to think about why that is. Right? Why, do, why is gray area hard? Is because you're having to assess danger all the time. So I need to know that you're either dangerous or you're not dangerous. And so if you're giving me a bunch of wishy-washy stuff, that doesn't work. The profession worse of this is my own. Social workers love things like, it depends, it's complicated, we'll see, right? So we really want, so again, if you, if you are kind of direct and informative, that's really quite helpful in trauma-informed care. We also, you can do trauma-informed care and never use the word trauma. It's about skill building, it's about advancement, it's about progress, it's not about rem reminiscing over trauma, unless that's a particular part of your job. But if you teach a budgeting class or a skills class, you're gonna do it knowing something about trauma. You might do 30-minute you know, sessions instead of an hour-and-a-half session because that's what the brain needs. All right, I'm going to quickly go through the science of trauma in like 10 minutes or less. So the science of trauma is based on four things. It's an acronym so that you remember it. Near science. And I'll tell you, if I, I keep remembering there's a camera, so I have to censor myself every once in a while. But what's really fun is we actually got, I actually got to have this conversation in front of legislators last session. So we had them do the hambrain. It's kind of fun. But near science, neurobiology, epigenetics, adverse childhood experience, and resiliency are the four bodies of knowledge for which trauma-informed is built upon. What's most important for you about that today is just to know it's not a feel-good, made-up thing. We actually have some reasoning behind it. Okay, we have some reasoning behind it. Now, neurobiology we've already talked about, but I'm just going to go through what these bodies of knowledge give us. Neurobiology tells us how our brains develop and how that development is impacted and how our brains are impacted as a result of trauma, stress, or adversity. Okay? So that's, the, that's why that body knowledge is important. There are four functions of the brain that are impaired as a result of trauma and toxic stress. And I'm going to quickly go through those because I think they really take place in your work a lot. And again, think about yourself as much as others. One is your sensory perception. So your senses are heightened in a time of trauma. Your senses are heightened in a time of trauma. So when you have a real or perceived threat, you actually have all these hormones that rush through your system to get you ready to respond. Okay? The first thing that gets released is this thing called catecholamine. And catecholamine knocks off your frontal lobe. Do you know why you don't want your frontal lobe in a time of threat? Yeah, you'll overthink. And when you overthink, you become really slow. Like the human species is like the worst in times of threat. Like, if you're natural disasters, who you should pay attention to are not your fellow human species. It's the four-legged and the wingeds. Be like, all right, that's we're going that way. Right? Don't look at your neighbor who's like, wait a minute. Let me get my map. Let me get my charger. Get my solar panels. Right? Like, you're done. So what's important, so catecholamine does that. Then cortisol kicks in to get you ready for the fight. Right? We also have your natural morphine starts to kick in to keep you from having pain. Then there's also this kind of other stuff that kicks in that kind of connects you to the trauma. All what's important about this is this is all kind of a part of survival, right? So at the time of a threat, your job is to do what? So survive. It's not to have wise brain or rational decision making or do a pro and con list or any of the other therapies we've taught people to do. It's to simply to survive. Now the big message about that is I think we're often the threat. 
So when I go to someone and say, hi, my name's Mandy, what I actually know is the first time I meet people, they're just trying to survive me. And I mean that. I don't expect them to remember a thing from the meeting. I expect them to just survive me, and then hopefully the next meeting there'll be less of that survival that gets activated. Okay, and you have to think about that in the sense of what you expect out of meetings with folks based on that. Now, I'll tell you a little funny trick about all those hormones. Peter Levine's work around this is like, how do you get rid of those hormones? Because, you know, and you know this, if you were ever in a, if you've been, ever been in a car and someone annoyed you and you got really mad, <sighs> you feel all that stress, you got to release that stress at some point if you're going to be healthy. Peter Levine found in like wild animals, you might know how animals release that stress because they're under threat all the time. You know what animals do? to not have PTSD. They run, usually. I mean, if they're not eating, they run, right? So they physically have moved. They sleep, shake, eat, and procreate. So when we talk about a workforce wellness plan, we're going to highly suggest you do most of those things on the job. The other one, do on your own, right? Because all of those things, eating, sleeping, shaking, having sex, all that stuff releases the toxins that are in your body. So we really do, on a workforce wellness strategy plan, we want to see some of those things take place. There's, there's a punching bag room, or there's a yoga room, or there's spaces for people to practice that stuff. So because of that heightened sense, sensories are, so right now what you want to think about is in the places you work, you want to do a sensory scan, the lights the sounds, the smells, what are all those things that are going to kind of maybe activate different populations or yourself in those spaces. There's a county in southern Oregon for which the WIC office used to be a jail and was also had psychiatric beds for folks over the history. It's never been painted differently. What we know from near science is that anyone walking into that space who's lived in that community for a long time is going to have a reaction to that space. Right? If you go home, if you go somewhere you were 10 years ago, you're going to remember it in that particular way. So you want to start to think about what are the senses that people experience. And again, what you want to know is for someone who's activated, a little bit sounds like a lot. So let me ask you this. How many of this room are pin clickers? You're in a meeting and you're pin clicking. Don't be shame. Raise your hand. How many of you are foot shakers? Okay. Any hair twirlers? A few. All right. So here's the deal. There's nothing wrong with all those coping strategies, right? They're free. They don't hurt anybody. The problem with things like pen clicking is when you're activated, the person beside you is clicking the pen, it sounds like a sledgehammer inside your head. And you will, if you're, and you've been stressed out and someone clicking a pen, you're just like, stop it. And they're like, dude, I'm just clicking a pen. But it really sounds really loud. So think about this. If you're in court, this is why people are in court, judges talking to them, they're like this. And you'll say, so what they say? Like, I don't know. But what I do know is everything else that happened. That person was clicking a pen. That person's phone went off. Two people just came in the door. But I have no idea what the judge just told me to do. Okay? So sensory overload and sensory perception is altered. Did you know that when you're stressed out that your attention isn't so good? So what you have is you have really good divided attention and not good selective attention. That's a fancy way of saying you're really hypervigilant. You attend to everything, but not to one thing. So if anything in your work requires someone to attend to what somebody's saying to them, it's not going to work very well if they're feeling stress. The best intervention for that is a third-party intervention, i.e. peer support. Have somebody go with you or audio tape. I audio tape myself all the time when I'm working with people. Can I just have your phone? I'm going to tape you a message, and I'm going to give it back to you. Listen to it later. Right? I had a doctor do that recently, which was lovely, except we put it on a CD. <laughs> And I was like, no one has a CD player anymore. But, but that was a good try. We're getting there, right? So think about kind of your attention. Now, here's a little trick to play on, I mean, not play on people, but like your family, because they're good for things like this. When people are activated, what they tend to hear is every third word. So start to pay attention to this. When people are activated because they're hearing everybody's third words, they'll put together third words. And if you think about what you just said, if you only put together every third word, it doesn't have the same meaning oftentimes is what you meant. Have you ever had somebody call your coworker and be like, Mandy said she didn't want to see me anymore. You're like, I never said that. I never said that. And yet what I might, you know, what maybe have said was, I really miss when you don't come. I'd really like to see you more. But in that stress place, I only heard a part of that. You do this when you get emails at work and you read the first line and it flips you out. 
And by the time you haven't read the rest of it, you're like, oh, my God, everybody's getting fired. And you forgot to read the, like, you know, April Fool's on the bottom part, right? So think about that around attention, what you're attending to and what you can't attend to. The last two things in your brain function that get impaired is your third is your memory. So you don't remember. You remember things that are threatening. You don't remember your appointment at 2 o'clock. Okay? It's not important for your brain to remember that. It is important for your brain to remember what's threatening. So, again, think about that. And why this stuff is so important is like, okay, that makes sense, Mandy. The attention and memory is impaired. But then what are we doing? Because what happens is, is I may say go to that appointment tomorrow. You don't remember. And then the system is going to hurt you for not remembering. And what trauma-informed care is saying is like you can't do that anymore. That's our fault now. Because if I know anything about trauma and stress, I know that you're not going to remember. Therefore, I'm going to need to call you or text you or go with you or take other measures. Is that making sense? Okay. The last one is executive functioning. The big words on this is this is your frontal lobe. And the two things your executive functioning does for you is organize and regulate. Organize and regulate. Do you notice when you're experiencing a lot of stress in your life, you're not very good at organizing or regulating? That's all it is. But that's, those are important kind of features that we often need in times of stress that aren't there. Now, epigenetics. I'm not a geneticist, so I can't speak to this. But what I'll tell you is this. This is how the kind of impact of trauma transmits across generations. And it's the idea that you're not what you eat. You're what your grandparents ate. And that's the way I think about this. It's not what you eat. It's what your grandparents ate. It scares me to think that my grandkids will be what I ate. <laughs> we'll just deny that reality for a little bit longer, right? What's important about epigenetics is it's why somebody might be standing in front of you experiencing traumatic symptomologies, and it may not make total sense to them. Because it may be how their generations of their people have been treated that have been kind of throughout that epigenetics, in the bones of a people. It's another way people talk about that. So it may feel like we might be like, well, I don't understand. This doesn't feel like that big, and yet it's, it very much is that big. Okay? And this is, a piece of, this is a body of science that is evolving very quickly, so we definitely want to attend to this. This is why in Flint, Michigan, with the lead crisis, that the families who experience that should at least get three generations of free health care. Because we know from epigenetics the kind of what's going to be transmitted across that generation and generation, at least three generations. So adverse childhood experiences. Raise a hand if you heard of this. So do you remember the big, the big message about adverse childhood experiences? Adversity in childhood impacts your adult health. Now, for a lot of us, we kind of knew that. But research does a good job of telling us things, validating things we already knew. What's important is what it said. One is it brought health care to the table because it connected adversity to things like COPD, stroke, brittle bones. So lots of things that we weren't understanding were connected to experiences of adversity. I always, and these slides, again, are available. I always want to point you to the right pyramid here. This was done by a youth-led youth organization in California called RISE. They studied the ACE pyramid and the ACE data, and they said, yeah, not quite complete. <laughs> so what they added here is generational embodiment and historical trauma then leads to social condition and local context, like what you have access to. That leads to then adversity, which leads to kind of disruptions in neurodevelopment, which leads to, and they change things from like adoption of health risk behaviors to coping, right? So I really, this is the pyramid you want to use. Because I think this is a social determinant of health. It gives a fuller picture, right? Because this is going to bring in the systemic oppression that causes a lot of this. And then, you know, resilience, good thing. Resilience is a good thing. So neuroscience, neurobiology, epigenetics, adverse childhood experience, and resilience. Resilience tells us what to do with all this, especially organizationally. So when I work with an organization or a system, I ask, how do you give your workforce opportunities for service, opportunities to connect, opportunities to have mastery or self-efficacy, and then opportunities for uh, self-reflection. I was at a very large hospital recently. In the beginning of every meeting, they do five minutes of self-reflection. I was like, whoa. Okay. The idea that self-reflection helps you think better during that meeting. And I don't mean self-reflection in like, like a therapeutic moment, but like a moment to stop Center yourself and then be present in the meeting versus if you ever run from one meeting to the next or one person to the next or one court case to the next, if you don't stop, you're bringing the next case in the door, right? You kind of, you, you kind of collect that trauma as you go. So here's the big message around the science is that those, these are those principles I talked about earlier, safety, transparency, peer support, collaboration, et cetera. So here's, what, here, here's how this goes. 
This is the why. Because of neurobiology, epigenetics, adversity, and resilience, this is the how. Because of the why, we have to do services in this way. We have to make sure that they're safe, focus on trustworthiness and transparency. Because you should start to think about why does a survivor of adversity need to have things to be transparent? Do you all like things to be transparent regardless of your history? Yeah. I mean, who doesn't want, who would say, like, I don't want transparency, right? But you want to think, I want you to keep pushing yourself to take it to the next step, which is why does a survivor of adversity or toxic stress, systemic oppression, is it critically necessary for things to be transparent? And it's because historically when things weren't transparent, people were hurt, right? People were hurt and bad things happened. So always push yourself to say, we all want safety. But if you, are, if, you are, if you don't have power and privilege, safety is even more critical to you, okay? So kind of think about that way as we go through. Now, application. So we're going to start to kind of wrap up. So I'm going to give you some ideas of application, and then we'll open up for questions. When we talk about being trauma-informed, we like to talk about it in three buckets, safety, power, and value. So and again, this will be too fast, but it's just to get you thinking. What we want you to do is we ask you to look at your agencies and do an assessment of how people feel. So we ask you to do this. For those who access your service, do they feel physically safe? And then we say, for those who are working in your, your organization or in your service, do they feel physically safe? Because if you don't feel physically safe, it's real hard to be cognitively part of a process. Like, it's hard for me to think about things you're asking me to think about if I don't feel physically safe. And what makes me feel physically safe may be different than what makes you feel physically safe. So it's an important to really spend some time on that. And then we have assessment instruments people are using around that. We look at things like your lighting, your bathroom, your parking lot. Those of you who know me know I have major issues with your signage. So think about signage. So I was in a courtroom doing a courtroom assessment of physical safety and trauma-informed care, and the door on the courtroom said, no cell phones. And I love the sign because it was big and the words were really clear and had a picture, the cell phone, a big no, because I like pictures and words. Because you're stressed out, you're not reading, right? You want a picture. So I was like, oh, that's great, but no. Does anybody know why I didn't like it because it said no cell phone? So the problem was, right, that's not what they meant. So think about this. So I walk up now and it says no cell phone. What am I supposed to do with my cell phone? And I was looking for, like, where's the basket, like, to put the cell phone in. Now, more importantly, think about that if I'm a person who doesn't feel like that system treats me very well, if I'm disempowered and I walk up and see that, let's say I'm going to case, I'm going for my court case, so I'm anxious, I'm nervous, I walk up, I've just gotten through security, right? I walk up to the door, it says no cell phone. I'm like, oh. And the only person I have available to ask is a person with a gun. So I'm really going to go up to the bailiff or the sheriff and say, excuse me, what should I do? That's not going to happen for most people. So most people, and while I'm sitting here starting to freak out and get dysregulated because now I'm getting nervous about what can I do, I can't, I don't have time to go back to my car because then I'll be late to my case. So now I'm sitting here getting dysregulated, my anxiety is getting up, and while I'm doing that, guess who's walking by me on their cell phone? Every lawyer and case manager and provider, right? Because they know that the sign doesn't mean what the sign means, but I don't. So now it's me, anxious, dysregulated, and it's us versus them. So what am I going to do with my cell phone is I'm going to tuck it in my pocket, and then I'm going to go in front of the judge. And the whole time I'm there, what do you think I'm doing? Oh my God, don't call my cell phone. Please don't call my cell phone. Please don't call my cell phone. And if you think if I'm worried about my cell phone, I'm paying any attention to my attorney or the judge or anything happening. Now, that's like a worst-case scenario, but those of you who work around trauma know that's actually a pretty typical scenario in the kind of brain of those who have experienced this before. And so we want to change the sign. What does the sign need to say instead? Yeah, like turn off your cell phone. It's that simple. They actually found with procedural fairness that signage made a big difference in courtrooms. So think about this. In hospitals or in your agency, do people know where to go when they come in the door? And again, you aren't the best person because you, you have learned to adapt. You want to ask somebody who's never been there to do a walkthrough, and you will be amazed at what you find that's probably activating. Because remember that trauma-informed care is an engagement tool. So I'm trying to get people in the door. And if to get to your door, I have to go through all these things that are activating, I'm not getting to the door. I'm going to take off. There's a self-sufficiency area in Southern Oregon, and they had people, they have no parking. People are showing up to get their benefits, basic needs met. And they would show up, and there'd be no parking. People would get agitated and activated. They would be, you know, running. They finally find parking, so they're coming into the building now angry and upset. 
because they may not get the, what they need for basic needs. Then they're yelling at people. People are yelling back at them. Then they're getting denied service. So you know their big trauma-informed intervention was on the phone call when they tell people their appointment, they say, our parking is horrible. Give yourself an extra 30 minutes, and here's what you should do. Here are your options. And they actually saw a reduction in people coming in kind of upset about that. So again, trauma from care isn't usually about a big federal grant as much as the little things you can do. We talk about emotional safety. So do people have access to their records? Are things transparent? Whatever you're looking at, am I also looking at? Right? You don't have pink pieces of paper in front of you, and I have green pieces of paper in front of me, and you don't explain that. Like, right? Because any of that, even though it may have the same thing, I'm thinking what is on yours is not on mine. So you have to think about it from that perspective. We look at restoring power. So how can we give people choice? Would you like coffee or water or tea? Anything you can do to give choice is creating new neurotransmitters and giving people a chance to kind of settle in and be a part of the process. So really striving for choice, not using relationships as threat. So if you don't do that, you can't see me anymore. We don't want to ever use relationships as threat because trauma often happens in relationship, and that attachment's really critical, okay? Peer support, peer support. Mm, how about some more peer support? And then we're just done. <laughs> We're done on value and all that. So we also talk about how do you show your staff that they're valued and how to show the people you serve that they're valued. This is an interesting thing to think about. I mean, do people come into your space feeling valued? Like you're like, I am glad that we are able to be here together today. I welcome you into this space. And we want all people to feel that way. And at the minimum, feel safe. Correction said to me, I don't want people to feel welcomed. It's like, okay. How about safe? We can change the words on that, right? But that people feel safe, that they'll be safe in your space. Some examples of what people do is they have scripts for response. They look at their intake forms. Again, vacation policies, supervision. So again, this is gonna span your entire organization, not just the services you do. I wanna move through, this is a great thing from uh, National, uh, I think it's NCTSN, National Child Traumatic Stress or SAMHSA. So this is for court, this is for judges. And it was a way to say things differently. And I bring it up because again, I want you to start to think about this stuff as you leave, is our language makes a difference. So instead of saying your drug screen is dirty, we would ask a judge to say your drug screen shows the presence of drugs. Does that sound different? So trauma-informed care is sometimes just changing the way we say things. Instead of saying, did you take your pills today? Like, think about that. What does that convey to you? Did you take your pills today? Does that feel welcoming and like you care and like you're engaged and you want to hear the answer? Or does that feel like you're kind of making some assumptions about things? Versus saying, hey, are the medications your doctor prescribed working for you? It's a different way of saying things. So this is a great thing for you to do in your, in wherever you work, is write down, we do this exercise sometimes, what are words that are hot spots? What are words or phrases that are activating automatically for folks in the job and those you serve? And then write a script for them. Write a new script for them. So it's a great activity kind of practice. All right, I want to introduce you to this thing called procedural fairness. Anybody heard about procedural fairness by a show of hands? I'm not, okay, a few. So procedural fairness is a kind of method of doing court work that is trauma, it's, it's the same thing as trauma-informed care. So I bring it up to you because a lot of initiatives out there are the same thing as trauma-informed care. It's just finding the language in your industry. Procedural fairness is functions on these things, voice, neutrality, respect, and helpfulness. They actually have more data than trauma-informed care. So the procedural fairness literature is pretty strong that if you, if you do court in this particular way, that folks will comply better even if they don't agree with the outcome. It was interesting, there was a study done around uh, speaking, around kind of respect and dignity, and your, your voice, your side was heard. They found that if you looked at someone in court and said, I'm not gonna change my mind on your case, but do you wanna share your story? But I'm not gonna, there's no way I'm changing my mind. That the person said yes, they wanted to share their story. No one changed their mind on the case disposition, but the person was more likely to comply and feel well treated. Think about that, five minutes sharing your story, even though I don't have to worry about changing how I felt about the case, made a difference. And there's a lot of research around procedural fairness that making a difference in one court case, this is gonna get big on you in a closed room, it's like you're gonna be like, I don't know what you're talking about, but it actually changes like civic engagement because people start to believe in the system. They start to kind of go, wait a minute, maybe the system has a purpose and isn't just here to get me kind of thing. And so it actually kind of is greater good around it. So the principles of trauma-informed care are the same principles of procedural fairness. Some of the things that we found in procedural fairness, the literature found in procedural fairness that changed were a couple of things that are important. It improved compliance. It was more likely people were to accept and cooperate. 
you had more value kind of by, by society. They felt like people, even though you can't control an outcome, you can control a process, so it felt more doable. And this whole perceptual expectancy thing. What's interesting is what does procedural fairness look like where things like this introduce, it's really focused on judges. So it was like, ask the judge to introduce themselves. That's one of the check marks on the procedural fairness. Like, there's assessment instrument for courtrooms, and it was like, judge introduces himself and thanks people for being on time. That's no federal grant or $4 billion intervention, right? So it was things like apologizing for delays. These were things they found significantly made a difference. Watch your, you know, look at language, explain the court rules, your body language. They found so much in judges' body language. We have a judge that I work with, and this judge is famous for this. She'll just like this. And as soon as she does like this, and I did, I did this little mini evaluation with people, and I was like, what's activating court? And they're like, every time she goes like that. And literally, people, as soon as she does this, people are like, ah. And I'm talking lawyers, caseworkers, everybody in court was like, ah. And I go to her, I'm like, what's up, what's up with this? And she was like, because I can't see. And I was like, right. Like, there's nothing wrong with this, right? But for some reason, every time she did that, everybody in court was like, hushed one over the room. So she got to laugh, and she's like, okay, everybody, look. There's nothing bad's happening. I just can't see. We joked that we should just buy her the new lenses so she wouldn't have to do that. That'd be a cheaper trauma-informed intervention than all the levels of cortisol being, like, you know, released in everybody's brains, right? So a lot's around eye contact. So we do things with judges like make eye contact. Whoa. But let me ask you a question. Why, why might judges not be making eye contact? Huh? Reading paper. And more importantly, most things are on a screen beside them over here now. So they're trying to keep up with what's going on over here. They forget that there are people here. So it's not, so what's really important about trauma-informed care change is that it's usually not because someone's trying to be traumatizing. It's that's where the system comes in. Because of the procedures and policies in place, judges can't turn around because they're trying to keep up with the docket. Okay? So one of the activities we do, and, and I'm telling you just, just in case you want to go do it, you can, again, I think there's a forum on our website, is we talk about hot spots for activation. So for some first point of entry to exit in your work, what are potential places where staff or those who are accessing your services might flip their lid? Can you think of any? Front desk, yeah. Nighttime checks. Anything else? Cigarette box. I don't even know what that is, but it sounds activating. What's that? Hub? So you want to think, and what we do is get people to write. I was with a detention center that had 800 of these. Okay, and so we get you to ask you, to, what are all those hot spots? And then we want to ask you, why do you do them? Because sometimes you just have to. It's like the federal government requires me to ask that question. Whatever it is, why do you do them? And then what can you do to make them less activating is how we start to make change. So an agency I worked with, one of the hot spots was shackles on the wall in, in the intake room. Can you understand why that would be activating? Now, when I said to the correctional officer, why do you have shackles on the wall? They were like, well, because we might need to shackle somebody. And I was like, okay, I'm not a correctional officer. So, again, what I don't you hear is I was kind of like, that's horrible, paint flowers everywhere. That wasn't my message. I was like, okay, well, if you, how often do you actually need the shackles? They're like, very rarely. I was like, okay, is there anywhere you can put them that's not on the wall? They're like, well, we need easy access. I was like, okay, is there anywhere you have easy access? They're like, well, yeah, there's a drawer in the desk. We could put them there. I was like, go do that. They're like, all right. So, I mean, it was, e it was an easy fix. We just don't stop to think about that, right? And that didn't require us. I mean, some things aren't easy fixes. And some of the big systems, those little things take like 4,000 forms. And I get that. But sometimes they're actually pretty easy fixes. So, you want to start to think about that. How do you, what are all those hotspots and how would you make them less so? I'm going to give you another hotspot for workforce. Here's a big hotspot for workforce as well as those accessing services, but more so workforce. Is, hey, can I see you for a second? Those words, or it could be, can you come to the bench? Or like, bing, right? Now think about that for a minute. Why do we say I need to see you? We think we're in trouble. That's why it's, an, that's why it's a hot spot. I blame it on the education system. because It feels like you're going to the principal's office, right? So we should blame all educators for us having activation points around that. But what I want you to hear is the words I need to see you aren't bad words. There's nothing wrong with saying I need to see you. How would you make that less activating? You would tell them why, right? Why do I need to see you? 
And if I can't tell you why, because for whatever reason I can't do that in front of others, then I shouldn't say I need to see you until I can stop and see you. What's really, what's really famous in our systems, because we're very crisis response related, is we'll be like, hey, I need to see you. I'll be right back. <laughs> now I'm over here dealing with four other crises. And so while I'm over here, what's happening to that employee over there? They're flipping out. Now think about it, that person who's worried about what's going to happen is in front of a group of kids they're teaching, or they have to go testify in court. Think about, I mean, think about what we've done to that person. This is why we also don't, don't want emails at night. There's no one wants to wake up to an email that says, can you see me when you come in in the morning? That's never a good thing, right? So we actually ask people, no emails after five. So you really want to think about this from kind of all of those different angles. And those hotspots are really a way to kind of get people to think about what might be activating. And you'll be surprised how much will be activating and how easy it could be to fix, about 60% of them. Some of them are larger order issues. All right, so as I kind of wrap up, and, and we'll stay available for either questions or you can come up and ask. But here's where I think I would suggest you think about this work. If you work in a courtroom, there's lots of information on how to make courtrooms trauma-informed. We even have a tip sheet on how to make for new judges on how to be a trauma-informed judge. And again, it's simple stuff. It's simple stuff, right? So you can look at that. There's good assessments out there. There's all of that work. If you do mental health work, how to be trauma. So again, how to be trauma-informed, fill in your profession, and then think about what that might look like. Because there's a lot of science behind this, but the practice, and you may actually not have to change anything to be trauma-informed. If you've been working in culturally specific programs successfully, you've been doing trauma-informed care way before we called it trauma-informed care. If you've worked with kind of underserved you know, folks who have experienced oppression successfully, then you've been doing trauma-informed care work. So kind of you just assess what you're already doing and where you might want to head. Place it easy, kind of places a lot of people start is assessing their physical environment. What is the message we're giving in our physical environment? How may it be activating people regarding that near? Consider language that's being used. What words are activating? In child welfare, there's a word called a phrase called concurrent planning. And it means while we're returning your child home, we're making another plan. And people in court will be like, hey, we're going to do concurrent planning. We'll adopt a Texas to the aunt. And no one stops to explain it. And it's super activating to hear. But people in the system are just so used to it, they don't think it's a bad word. So kind of get used to your language and consider doing that differently. Look at your policies and procedures. When do you have to ask what question? By when? Do attorneys have kind of private space to talk to folks, right? How are all those things happening? Attend to workforce wellness. And when I say workforce wellness for you all, I would like to also ask you to think about workforce wellness across systems. One of the things that we're working on in a couple court projects is how to have like a fishbowl experience. Because if you take a case and you look at the social worker and the mental health therapist and the psychiatrist and the attorney and the judge and the peer support, I want to have like a bubble head of what they're all thinking at different times. Because we have different purposes. I had lawyers at a project with lawyers, and they're like, these caseworkers think that we don't want our folks to go into treatment. But if they don't want to go to treatment, it's not our job to make them go to treatment. Like, that's not my job as an attorney. And I was like, we need to have those conversations. Because we like to really get on, we like to take our stress out on each other. And that just tears up a system really quickly. So that parallel process, the same things that we're experiencing with stress, we start to show in each other, which then shows all the way up the chain and across industry and agency. So the workforce wellness needs to extend not just internally, but to our partners and our coworkers in the field. If you need to do trauma-specific services, then you need to pay attention to that. Know who does those, how to refer for those. And then find ways to have continued education. Like how do you, this again, an hour and a half of trauma-informed care is like rapid fire of nothing, right? So like how, if you're like, this is interesting, how can you have little, somebody had some great phrase for this, like little drops of it every once in a while, right? So how do you put it into different things? Trauma-informed Oregon hopefully will have some of those online modules available as we go through. So I'm going to stop talking. I'm gonna, I think what I'm going to do, just because I know something about people's behavior, um, let me ask this. Is there anybody that wants to ask a question that's on the record in front of folks? Excellent. Okay. Uh -huh. Well, I just meant there's a camera going so people know that versus ask me later. Do you want to? Hello. Um, when I think about applying these concepts to, like, where I work, or places I might work in the future and the places I have, um, I think the first thing that comes to mind is uh, whatever stakeholder decision maker you're talking to is going to say, uh, what's in it for me? Um, and I know you addressed that to some extent here, and it is good when uh, patients, clients are more, uh, they're not angry with you, when they're more cooperative. 
but oftentimes that I don't feel like that's enough to really sway whoever that person is. Like, is there is there a bigger motivator in your experience yeah. that works? Yeah. Yeah. So that's a great question, and you know, one we're actively working on. So, kind of why why bother from kind of an organizational or business perspective? A couple things. We actually think you know, if people are engaging in services, then we're going to do more economically good services, right? Showing up, being part of versus constant turnover. We actually think the three outcomes that we're measure we're looking at measuring right now is workforce retention. So that's what actually we're paying attention to is workforce retention because it's really expensive when you have constant staff turnover. And it's, I mean, it's not only a mental health wound to have to reattach every time your caseworker is different, but it's a huge cost on, on industry, you know, kind of on industry. So we think we'll actually save money on workforce retention. We'll do a better job um, of long-term cost of adverse childhood experiences because we're going to get it in prevention. There's actually a business in another state, and they were finding, they're like, a, they were a mining coal business, and they were finding that people were, like, they were losing workers a lot. They actually brought in a mental health specialist around adverse childhood experiences. What they found was a lot of folks who had adverse childhood experiences don't do so well when, they're rep when they were like, are corrected by a boss, when they hadn't had any kind of work around that. So they brought in a mental health specialist to do some of that work, and people were staying on the job longer, right, and doing kind of good work on the job. So, and so we'll see healthcare benefit. We hope to see healthcare costs reduce over time because of kind of the use. So we're looking at costs in those three ways, but it's a pretty new field, so we're get hopefully getting there. Yeah. Let me go back here and then come here. Well, some of the people that I work with obviously could use uh, the last thing you were talking about, but there are policies and procedures. They have it, you can do one thing in the front, and they have it, you can do something in the back. So people are never consistent. They say individualized treatment, oh yeah, that's all fine and dandy, but how do you force people to correct their policies and procedures so we don't have the fluctuation? <laughs> no, no small question. Um, so a couple of things about that, because um, it's no small question. How do you hold people accountable for doing this work? So a couple of things I think are, ha just to tell you that are happening. Oregon has a trauma-informed care policy right now that says if you receive funding from health systems, you need to strive to be trauma-informed. So we've actually got some standards out that are happening so that people have to speak to that. I think one of the tricks that we have to do, now you can have great policies, and if they're not implemented consistently in a trauma-informed way, then they're not good policies. Have you ever heard that thing that says good practice turns to bad policy? Right, because all of a sudden everyone has to do a certain thing and it doesn't work. So I, I don't have a great answer on how to hold people accountable. I think. So three standards in our, in our standards, three of those relate to you have to have a feedback with loop with those with lived experience or access in your services. I think if we put value and money and support behind lived experience voice kind of to be there, then we'll hear those things in a different way that we're not even hearing about them right now. So I think that's, I think that's one area we have to promote in a, a more systematic way. There's also stuff happening on the national level around some policies that are starting to come around. I think what we have to be really careful about and smart about is um, integrating the initiatives. So is anybody here do equity work or ever done an equity initiative in their programs? Is that hit you? So we want equity to be connected to trauma-informed care and then resiliency, because here's what happens in systems, is they're like, we're gonna do equity. And they're like, but that was really hard to talk about racism. So let's do trauma-informed care. Well, that's really hard to talk about trauma. So now let's talk about resiliency. Now we're gonna go back, and so our systems don't even know what they're doing and why they're doing it anymore. So to, for my job, is like, Hold the central thing is, you know, is it individualized treatment, kind of what is the goal, and then hold the accountability measures that are, that are easy to use and not 15 pages. Because we put accountability on systems to figure out how to tell us that they're accountable, and they don't have time to do that in a good way either. Um, so that's a really long way to say, I don't know. But I think, I think some of the trauma-informed care language might help us figure that out in a different way. Because it's no longer about, like, do ABC. It's like... So when I'm measuring people, like I'm going to come to your agency, I'm going to measure the folks you serve and say, do you feel safe and valued? How you do that, and I don't, I mean, you've got to figure out how to do that. But I expect that to be what I hear from the folks you serve. And I don't think we'd hear that from a lot of our systems right now. Um, and I think that's a different level of measurement versus, did you do six treatment plans by 30 days? Kind of, you know. But we also have to get insurance. We're also looking at hotspotting insurance around high, adver you know, so there's lots of that reimbursement stuff. 
There's some stuff on social determinants health and CCO money happening. Mm, this happened. There was another question. You would have sat beside me. <laughs> so um, your your statistics were amazing, and I love the way your information flowed. Um, you said something about trauma informed doesn't mean that we have to accept like inappropriate or unsafe behavior from the people that we serve. And I agree. The problem that I see in um, working with other systems is that a lot of times the um, black and other um, people who are of a different race other than the dominant culture, when they um, come in off the street or long-term prison, of course they don't know the pro-social behavior, but when we bring them into our systems care, we kind of expect them to do, like we have these lists of rules that we want them to follow by. So how are we teaching on a broad um, level in Portland or other, other Oregon areas that you know trauma-informed care is different, especially with you know when we're working with people of color. Because what I'm seeing is that um, a lot of the people who have never been around black people, have never worked with black people, they can be scared already. As soon as you raise your voice, or as soon as you throw a chair, or you know, it's it's and it's not so much as like for me and like other people that I work with. It's like, oh my God, come here, you need a hug, you need you need this work. Let me work with you. I'm not gonna give up on you. That means nothing to me. I see your pain. For somebody else, it's like, call security. And like, I see so much call security. Like, I'm interested in someone is power for you. What are you guys doing to like address that part of it? So, um, so a couple things. One, I think, you know, well, so at our organization, we're doing around kind of also trying to make sure we're talking about implicit bias as we talk about the policies and procedures, right? And making sure we have lived, we have voice of diverse populations making the policies. Because the problem is if we don't do that, right, then the policies are coming through the dominant lens and they're not going to be relevant. I think the other thing, and this isn't necessarily an answer, but I think it's an important thing that, that came up recently in a school-based situation where we talked about how, so this is where in trauma from care, we want to turn the lens on the system. So you come to me and say, he just threw a chair at me. What should I do about him? I'm going to turn around and say, what was going on with you and in the system that caused that chair to be thrown? And, and we have to say that gently, like, you know, because people are like, well, it's not, a, you know. But that's the qu different question that we want to ask because what's, cause exactly what you're saying, what I get concerned about is us saying, you're, you shouldn't throw chairs, you shouldn't do whatever is, um, let's see if I say this right, is actually just asking people to assimilate into dominant culture. So it's that balance between what's safe behavior versus simulating behavior. And I, and I don't have an easy answer for that, but I think that conversation, so when we go in to assess the situation, those questions that we use, the first five need to be about what was going on in the environment and in the person who had the power in the room, the teacher, the mental health counselor, the judge, before it goes to the person's behavior. And we very much believe that, you know, 80% of the time it's going to be something in that and then we can, and then because that's the why. Trauma from care we say is about the why. If you can't say why someone threw the chair, then you got to back up and get some education differently. Because for everything that happens, I'm going to be able to say, oh, I kind of get why that happened. I said this, and they said that, and we forgot to include you in that. We should be able to. Those should be the debriefs. And I don't think our debriefs include that. I don't think one we debrief so that we don't learn how our bias got into that. And I don't think we have the right questions in debrief because they're usually like, you know, what was the safety protocol not followed? And that's not going to get there. But that's the easiest thing I can say, except for that it's starting to happen. I mean, at least the conversation, I think, is starting to happen. But I do think we should talk about a simulation versus, you know, like, like correct, what is correct, but who gets to define the behavior, right? That's why I don't say appropriate behavior, because I'm like, Bleh. Yes. Um, I think the
Uh, obviously not that one. Um, so a couple of things. I don't think, uh, like, so we're trying to back up trauma-informed care into professional education. And so what comes with trauma-informed care is hopefully the lens of systemic oppression, like, because you can't talk about trauma-informed care without. So we just got a course at PSU that's trauma-informed care for social workers. We're trying to back it up in OHSU into doctors. I don't know the counseling that, like, in Oregon that that's there. I think we could look at, I think it needs to go into continued education. But I think also how we define what content is there needs to be folks who know the content, right? So it's not a checkbox of cultural diversity. You know, like, because you could say, yeah, I got a training. That doesn't mean I have any competency in that, right? I also think the other thing I'm interested in doing, then I will kind of stop and people come talk later because I love this stuff, is I think we need to also get more people of color and, and you know, trained and in a position of kind of power and supervisory positions, right? So we need to back up the education into like what scholarships, where we're we putting money, where are we getting so reflective supervision, supervision early childhood. We have a lot of white supervisors who are supervising folks of color and they, you know, at some point, that doesn't work. I mean, it doesn't mean it doesn't work to a certain extent, but we need all of the above. But that means we need more folks who are doing the work, who are in supervisory positions. So I'm like, I'm like let's fund people of color to go get trained to be reflective supervisors, because I, I think that's going to be an important and kind of imperative thing to make, the, to make the workforce more diverse, especially in Oregon. Especially in Oregon. So thank you. I know it's 2.30. Thank you for your time. Enjoy your break. <laughs> Goodbye.